Hey everyone back again. Now we're going to pick up with the second half of Bell Hooks' Feminism is for Everybody from Chapter 9 all the way to the end. Before jumping into it, you know, go check out Part 1, of course. If you want to follow me, you know, all different places, links, whatever, help me out, like, share, subscribe. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, you can leave a review. That'd be cool. And yeah, without further ado, let us jump into this half here, the second half of the text. Now, really, I want to emphasize a content warning because we're going to be talking about domestic abuse and violence against women. So, you know, take care of yourselves. Just know that that's going to be uh, part of what we talk about here because certainly when we talk about feminism, we have to consider these things. Now, starting with chapter nine, uh, titled Women at Work. Now, during second wave feminism, the right to work was framed as a liberatory project, as a liberatory opportunity. The right to work was a way by which women believed that they were going to claim equality. Now, it wasn't all women. And, you know, when we talk about the waves of feminism, you know, wave one being like from the 1880s-ish till the 1950s-ish, wave two from the late 1950s, 60s-ish to the 80s, 90s-ish, you know, there's, you know, the, these things are not set in stone. So it's always important to note that when we talk about second wave feminism and what I'm saying now about the effort to enter the workforce, that wasn't all feminists. That was just some of them, largely the loudest amount. And what we've already talked about is that this was something sought mostly by white middle class women. Women of color, poor women were always working. It wasn't like they were like, oh God, I can't wait to get out of the home and go go work because they were already working. Now, Hooks clarifies that though that work isn't liberating and that as a black woman, she never had the option to simply stay at home. Like I just said, for her, she always had to be, uh, <laughs> she always had to go to work. I mean, that wasn't like, it wasn't an option to just get to stay in the large home take care of the kids, clean the house, white picket fence, dogs, you know, whatever. That wasn't just an option for her. Now, Hooks obviously has no problem with women wanting to work. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But it is proven to not be nearly as liberatory as some people made it out to seem. Women experience high rates of gender-based discrimination at work, for example, other kinds of harassment and women are paid significantly less than their male counterparts. Even very much still true to this day, but certainly true 50, 60 uh, years ago. Now, now, while we are like, critical of this, or we want to interrogate these efforts and to problematize their association with white women, that is, this feminist element or this feminist movement was largely ignoring the experiences of women of color, It's important to note that economic independence is super important for women to have freedom because if they do not have the opportunity to work, they are going to be forced to rely upon in heterosexual dynamics on men for everything, for their shelter, their food, everything else. And so they're going to be dependent on them. And so they can't just pick up and leave if they're in an abusive relationship, for example. So having economic dependence is one way by which to actually uh, emancipate oneself from a potentially abusive dynamic. Now, the feminist effort to center the workforce highlights a shifting economic terrain where families can't survive on one income any longer. Again, this is this is strictly like, you know, thinking about the 1950s and 1960s in America, this was really in reference to white families, where for a long time, well, a long, kind of, you know, a few years in the United States, it was possible for a family of like four or five to depend upon a single income. That is one person, most of the cases, the father would earn enough money for everyone. Now that began to change. Austerity measures kicked in. Less and less government funds were actually going to helping people. Corporations started to get larger, more and more money in corporations started to be siphoned off into offshore banks and stuff taken out of the economy, 
less money to go around, more people then forced to work in order to make ends meet. So women were forced to actually enter the workforce, not just because they wanted to be liberated from male oppression or to exert a kind of autonomy in the workforce, but also because they had to. Their families depended upon it. No longer would one income be enough to actually keep the family afloat. So the underwriting theme here that Hooks wants to draw our attention to is the way that work under capitalism is oppressive. And that's a big claim to make because I don't know, I don't know what you all know, but just to explain what that means simply, to give you a kind of snapshot of what Marx, Marxist critique looks like, Marx said really quite famously, he was like, the only way that people are able to make profit under capitalism is if somebody is being underpaid for their labor. So for example, if I go and work at McDonald's, and um, you know my ratios and my numbers are going to be wrong here, but I think the point is still going to be accurate. If I work at McDonald's and I make McDonald's $11 in an hour, but they only pay me $10, what that means is that I've been shortchanged $1. I have made the company $11, but I've been paid $10. Now, in reality, the situation is much worse. Like, an hour of my labor, my labor power at McDonald's will likely earn, you know, three, four, five times what I'm actually paid. But let's just stick with the $11 versus $10 example. In that moment, my labor power, or, you know, I can pose the question to you, what is my labor power actually worth for one hour? Is it $10 or is it $11? The objective true answer is that it's worth $11. It has earned $11 in the market. The burgers I've made, or whatever, or the fries, whatever, anything that I've made has earned $11 in the market, while I've only been paid $10. So in that way, industry under a capitalist economy is by nature exploitative and therefore oppressive. But really, though, come on, if it, if it was really just like $11 to $10, it, you know, who's going to complain about that? But that's, you know, certainly not the reality today. You look at what the CEOs of McDonald's make versus the average employee, or another good example is like Disneyland. For example, if you look at Disneyland, and I, did the, I crunched the numbers on this a few months ago, if you go to Disneyland in California and... You look at, or actually look at how many people are working on any given day. You can look all this up and how much they're paid on average. And then you compare how much a Disneyland park or that Disneyland park makes in profit. That's profit. After they paid everyone, everything else, they make in profit in a day. They could pay each employee an extra $100 a day and they would still make like $8 million in profit for that day, which is like, it just seems like, well, maybe they should then pay people a little bit more if they can. So I'm using this example to illustrate that it is in the interest of the capitalist system to always lower how much they're paying their workers while raising how much they're paying the CEOs or themselves, the capitalists. So this is what Hooks means when she says, that under capitalism, all work is oppressive, something that Marx and, and others have said before her as well. Or, well, she'd be, she, you know, she's borrowing from Marx. It was really Marx that discovered this, which, okay, that's not true, but there were, you know, whatever. It was <laughs> made famous by Marx. Now, at the government level, the governmental level, we see also, like, endless cuts to social programs, endless cuts to actually like funding education, especially in the United States, funding health care and other things. But meanwhile, there's infinite money to go to war efforts, infinite money to buy fighter jets and planes and, and everything like that. But when it comes to actually paying for better schools, then there's no money or better hospitals, then there's no money or giving people better infrastructure, then there's no money. So why does all this matter? How does this relate to 
sexist oppression? Well, simply, if people are struggling, that's going to amplify the oppression that they experience. If families are struggling, women are going to be more and more dependent upon men because sexism dictates that men will be the most likely to get a job first. And so in a heterosexual dynamic or couple, women are going to be more and more dependent upon men. If the state is cutting services, women are going to have fewer access to reproductive health care, have more access to any services dealing with abuse for, or that can help a woman deal with abuse or get out of an abusive relationship. All of these things are connected. And that puts us here into chapter 10, race and gender. So we now know that feminism has historically prioritized white women and white women's experiences. But in its early days, this was kind of ironic because some early feminists were also abolitionists. And then later, civil rights advocates. If you want more on this, I've covered Angela Davis's Women, Race, and Class, or Women, Class, and Race. I forget the, I forget the order. Uh, you can go and check that out if you'd like, in which she sh supplies us the history of feminism's involvement in the abolition movement, white feminism's involvement in the abolition movement as well. Now, when the suffrage movement kicked off, that is, women fighting for the right to vote, some white women feared that black men would earn the right to vote before them, which is was kind of a negative uh, reason to start the suffrage movement. They wanted to earn the right to vote because they didn't want black men to have the right to vote. There was a fear among white women that if black men had the right to vote, that'd be, that would mean there were more men out there to oppress them in political power. So many white feminists feared considering black women's experiences because it would dilute their own understanding of sexism. When white women were fearing black men's ability to gain the right to vote, not, not all white feminists were thinking this, some of them, uh, they also wanted, to, or they also deliberately disavowed uh, black women's experiences because they were totally different from their own. White women believed, or white feminists believed at the time, that if they started to consider other women's experiences, it would make it more difficult for them to attain their goals. On the other hand, black women, anti-racists and feminists, to them, and I think they're right, believe that the only actual way to combat sexism would be to include black women's experiences, because black women are women too. Black women experience the world as women and undergo and experience sexist oppression. What better way to actually identify the problem of sexism, the oppression of, oppression of sexism, than to include as many victims as possible and to include their voices and experiences to better understand how sexism operates and how patriarchy functions to privilege men at the expense of women's uh, bodies and their labor. Now, everything I've said so far about this should indicate that there's there has historically been a rift or a split between black and white women feminists in their fight against sexism. And this is still true to this day. Where feminism is like the most alive, at least kind of, you know, in the cultural political imagination, is in academia. And academia in gender and women's studies programs is overwhelmingly white. It reflects largely the interests of white women still. So while much progress has been made, certainly there's still a long way to go before feminism actually is an inclusive, equitable project in opposing sexism in all its forms. And that puts us here into chapter 11, titled Ending Violence. So feminists have made great strides in opposing and exposing the world to the ubiquity of gender-based violence, just how common gender-based violence is. Also though, in making us aware of same-sex abuse. So like Hooks said last time in the last episode, or the first half of the book, she's clear that sexism and patriarchy don't have anything really to do with men and women, like biologically, where she says that men are victims to sexism just like women are, not as much, of course, and women can perpetuate sexism as much or more than men. It's not like women are magically predisposed 
to not being sexist. You know, they can contribute to it as well. And so we can see patriarchal and sexist violence even play out in settings where uh, there's a same-sex couple, for example. But when thinking about this, she strays away from or encourages us not to adopt the language or refer to this as domestic violence. Instead, she suggests that this is patriarchal violence. She thinks that this is more accurate because cases of domestic abuse are rooted in sexism, even when it is between two, two same-gendered people. Now, despite this, it is highly gendered, of course, like we know. More than 80% of all like domestic, and that's a conservative estimate, of all domestic abuse cases are men acting violently and committing violence against women. But in any situation, any instance of intimate partner violence, Hook suggests that this is patriarchal because patriarchy and violence go hand in hand. They are both, or patriarchy uses violence as an instrument of power. Power is exercised in this way to exert control over people. Any time that there is an effort to exert physical coercive control over people, this resonates with histories of patriarchal oppression of men committing violence against women to control their bodies. And of course, this extends to children as well, where children experience, uh, of course, they experience so much abuse by both men and women, parents and adults. So even in cases where women inflict violence against children, Hooks is clear that this is an example of patriarchal violence because it is a demonstration of power through, uh, through physical force and violence. And this is like, this is socialized into young boys. Like a lot of the time, young boys are taught that they're, they're supposed to be aggressive and violent. They're not supposed to have any connection to their feelings or their emotions or to be expressive. They have to engage in physical uh, contact sports and really and be competitive. And so it's, it's important to acknowledge how these things are not biological. Men don't have a biological predisposition towards violence. Tons of men don't ever commit it. And if it was a biological certainty, that would be really weird. Instead, we have to acknowledge the way that society plays a part in encouraging boys in this way. And then when they become men, those of us who haven't recognized the faults in it might be more inclined to commit those acts of violence. And if anyone wants more on this, there's a really great documentary. Uh, it's not it's not an easy watch, of course. Like you really go into the content warning because it discusses a lot of violence against women and racism. Uh, but it's called Tough Guys. Tough, like spelled the you know standard way but then guys spelled G-U-I-S-E. Really great documentary. I think you can find it on YouTube for, um, for free. I really recommend it. It's a great introductory view or approach to understanding masculinity and understanding uh, the way that masculinity is associated with violence and what happens in our culture to encourage boys to be violent. And then they grow up to be violent men. You know, the whole like, oh, boys will be boys thing as a way to brush off male violence or boys being violent and just being like, oh, it's just how they are. Instead of like actually sitting down with a young boy and saying like, this is what you, you're actually not allowed to do that. That's something that can't happen. And that puts us here into chapter 12 titled Feminist Masculinity. So it's too narrow to blame men for sexism, right? Like, we know it's a broader issue than that. Like, it's, it's so much bigger than that. And of course, this isn't to deny men's culpability here. Men are the primary benefactors, or they benefit the most from patriarchy, while women, in general, experience the most oppression as a result of it. And it's not like a little majority more, right? It's like most men experience some kind of privilege because of patriarchal power. This doesn't, you know, and people like to, if you, you know, go on the internet at all, you'll see certain ding-dongs being like, oh, well, if that's true, then how can you, how can you explain like men who are poor or something? 
And it's important, and this is a sociological idea, to distinguish what is a systemic privilege or what is a systemic situation versus what is an individual one. Now, there's truly no individual instance of like total responsibility, right? People are absolutely subject to their environments. But we need only look at the history of <laughs> the relationship between men and women in the West, because I mean, that's the context I'm in that we're talking in that I happen to be the most aware of in Europe and North America. You compare the number of world leaders in that setting or in the entire world for that matter, who've been men versus women. You can compare the number of religious leaders who've been men, who've been women, compare the number of corporate leaders, men and women, institutional leaders like in academia, compare that. And you'll find that like between 90 and 100% of the time in all these cases, it's all men. And it's like, there, ha there has to be some kind of systemic privilege here, right? It's not, it's not like there's just, it just happened like this. So, you know, someone else might say, okay, well, this just means that they, men have a biological, uh, I guess, they're biologically predisposed to these types of positions. And the, the only sane response to that would be like, oh yeah, because cavemen had CEOs, cavemen had presidents. I don't know if cave, caveman's the proper term. Troglodytes, I don't know. People from 100,000 years ago. I mean, we've had this world, this society for the last 10,000 years, or at least the first states, while we've been humans for like, like 100,000 years. And it's like, really? We are biologically predisposed? That, like, g g give me a break. Now, we know that men receive most of the privilege that pa patriarchy can offer, like a vast majority of the privilege. And so there's a lot of power when men speak against sexism, or it does a lot of good work, because it acknowledges this position, and it completely gets rid of the possible rebuttal that it's like, oh, well, you're just bitter or something, which is something I try to do, and I know that other people do it a lot better, but it's extremely important for men to speak up against sexism and to act as role models that are not these hyper-aggressive macho dudes who just find their only way to exist in the world by their being aggressive or exerting force on other people. It is an uphill battle, though, because mass media, the you know, social media algorithms will not feature male feminists nearly as much as they're going to feature some, you know, some feminist who, who to the cultural imagination will look like not, um, won't look like an upstanding citizen to our hegemonic and oppressive idea about how people should look. And they'll be branded as like lesbian man-hating feminists and then people will rage about it and it'll just be like, those are the kinds of people who will get featured the most in our world. Which means that as feminist men, or as feminists in general, it's important to be as vocal as humanly possible so that these voices are actually heard. They actually break through all of the, all of the sound, all the noise. And the point is not to do away with masculinity outright. Like there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that inherently. The point is to offer men more opportunities to have more meaningful connections in the world beyond just like playing video games with one another so that they can actually be open with that one another, embrace other men, learn to care for other people instead of just thinking about their place in the world as being their own, you know, their own role in the world and they're not being other people. And this, I, you know, I personally, I fundamentally believe will lead to the betterment of men's lives. It might mean that men don't go on killing sprees because men commit the most uh, violent acts in this world. They might be less likely to commit suicide. They might be less likely to commit domestic violence. They might be more likely to have better connections with their friends and families and others, more meaningful connections that give them more complete and fulfilled lives. And that puts us here into chapter 13, feminist parenting. So for some feminists, teaching children is the most important act to make a better, non-sexist future. Now, unfortunately, girls are often the focus of these teachings, like how to avoid, uh, girls are taught how to avoid men, how to identify abusive men, how to ask for raises at work. 
And it's a lot rarer for parents to sit a boy down and be like, don't be an abuser. Learn to respect women like you do other men or other boys. Or teaching young boys about consent. These things are a lot more rare. And so this is why it's extremely important to hold both boys and girls up to the same standard. Girls are taught so many things that young boys are not taught. Girls are taught how to actually, like, keep their house clean. Whereas boys, it's not as common in the West to actually teach boys that. To teach them how to actually, you know, take care of themselves. Where they are just, like, you know, everything is taken care of for them. Now, not all efforts to teach children by women are happen in a, in a good way. Hooks recounts being at this dinner party where there was another guest who described how she was she would pinch and hit I think I think just pinch her children until they would be compliant and everybody there was like yes you need to do that of course you need to hurt your children in order to make them compliant to make them docile and Hooks was just like in absolutely in horror at the at the thought of this like you know and I don't think Hooks has any kind of like is existing in a fairy tale land where a parent can't lose their temper. You know, you should still never hit your child. But the point was that that Hooks is drawing her attention to, or our attention to, is that everybody there was like approvingly, like, yeah, sometimes you have to be a little bit violent with your children, which is like, what? Clearly, no, that is not that that's not good. So anti-sexist men need to be more involved in their children's lives and learn to take the burden off of women in heterosexual relationships. There's a really, there's a, uh, I think it's on, it's a podcast, but it's this uh, person who does this work called the Fair Play Podcast, and they have an Instagram page in which they do this kind of work in helping men actually be able to take up more and more labor in the, in the house to take that obligation off of women. Because as we discussed in the last episode, women are not only expected now to like have a job, which is a big, big burden, but after that job, when they go home, they're going to be more expected to do all of the house duties, the child duties, everything like that, that men are not going to be expected to do. Men, men will just get home and then play video games until they go to bed or something. And this isn't to say that single mothers can't be great parents who raise great children or that a parent needs a father figure or a parent, a family needs a father figure. Like none of that, that none of that is true. It's just like, if there's going to be a man around, it's probably better for his partner. If they have a kid that the partner, the woman is not raising two kids, like a man who's just like, doesn't pick up after himself or just like, doesn't know how to do anything. Like that's not helpful to anyone. That'll make that'll raise the stress in the family household and probably uh, make it harder for that kid to have a, like a normal relationship with their parents because there's going to be heightened stress, there's going to be more difficulties, there's going to be everything else. Like, the you know, the, the, there's a domino effect here. And that puts us very appropriately to chapter 14, titled Liberating Marriage and Partnership. So feminists have long had a fraught relationship with heterosexual marriage because historically it has been an oppressive institution. You know, you think of, think of the entire pageantry around marriage itself, where you have a father literally, literally handing off his daughter to another man. This just signifies that in marriage, women are just like these objects to be, to be traded like cards or like cattle you know, with the way we treat animals in this world. Like, it's just about, like, ownership. Now, there are other options, of course, like non-heterosexual uh, couplings, like lesbian women, or non-monogamous couplings that allow people, not just women, because, again, feminism is for everybody. Feminism is something that wants to improve men's lives as well. Like, non-monogamous couplings that allow people to not uh, put all of their expectations onto one other person in in every walk of life, like sexually, romantically, uh, socially, which is what we do with heterosexual couples. We put everything onto one other person to satisfy all of our wants and desires. 
which is a big burden to put on one person. Wouldn't it make more sense if this was split out? Or split out. Spread out a little bit? I think it would make a little bit of sense. But it's not, like, easy to do. Every single structure, every institution in our world, every bit of entertainment points us in the direction of finding that one person to spend the rest of your life with, and that's just what's supposed to happen. But in many of these instances where, the, you know, you have the romantic, heterosexual ideal play itself out, women often find themselves to be the least satisfied sexually, romantically, intimately, uh, domestically, socially, culturally, women are the most dissatisfied. And it makes sense. Like the entire history of how men actually, or entire history, that's a big term, but like most men learn about what it means to be a partner through other media and entertainment that's been created by men. So they consume so much entertainment where like sex teaches them, it teaches them that sex stops after the man finishes for example, or that sex must include penetrative acts. Like, all of these things that do not account for the various ways that men and women experience pleasure and how they desire and want to be desired. But the social scripts that we have in place that encourage us to adopt compulsory heterosexuality, to use Adrian Rich's term, all of this just teaches us that we should never question it we should never ask if it's really what we want or if there are, al are alternatives. And as a result, it just perpetuates cycles of oppression, where in many situations, women will feel like it's their fault if they're in an abusive dynamic because they've done everything right. Like they've followed all the scripts, but it's, you know, they might be being abused and then therefore it's their fault because the men are just doing what they've been told. They're taught not to be like helpful in the house, they're taught to be aggressive, they're taught to be rude, everything like that. And so women easily internalize any kind of abuse as their own fault. And that puts us here into chapter 15, a feminist sexual politic and ethics of mutual freedom. So women have historically been denied sexual freedom in the West, unless it was to satisfy men's desires. So much of sex education is framed around prohibition instead of increasing knowledge about pleasure. So for example, perhaps you could think back to your own, if you're living in the West, think back to your own experience with sex education, and you will likely recall being told what not to do. Like, don't have unprotected sex, you know, don't have sex before marriage, uh, wait till you're 18, like, if you are going to have sex, use a condom, like, chances are... You weren't taught about different ways to have sex, different people to have sex with, different ways to experience pleasure with your body. Our whole culture is one... I'm being very general, of course, so lend me an olive branch. But I'm, our whole culture, at least in terms of sex, is organized around treating sex as something that should be kind of hidden away, but that we are nevertheless obsessed with. And what that does is it helps to perpetuate what has been established as the normative, the, the norm of sex, that is heterosexual couplings, monogamous heterosexual couplings. And it just says like, oh, this is normal, so we don't need to talk about it. Everyone knows it's in all our entertainment, all our media, and blah, blah, blah. All that anyone ever needs to get taught about it in any serious way then is just how to not get diseases, how not to get pregnant, blah, blah, blah. Of course, it in doing that, it completely covers over and erases all the other kinds of sexual couplings and ways of enjoying one's body, how all of that is just completely shut out of the conversation. Now, in terms of sexual liberation, of course, the introduction of the birth control pill in the mid-20th century was a great advantage for many women because it allowed them to engage in sexual acts that wouldn't necessarily lead to pregnancy but it didn't really go far enough to actually account for all of the difficult aspects of sexual liberation. So some men saw this as an opportunity to satisfy their own desires. Some women, fearing this, turned from men completely and became lesbians that Hooks uh, recounts. So men were like, oh, if someone's on the pill, I don't need to worry about them getting pregnant or something. 
which isn't really the point here, you know. If we're framing it as women's sexual liberation, we shouldn't really be factoring in men's uh, pleasure here at all. At least, not maybe a bit, you know, because feminism is for everybody. But Hooks obviously thinks that anyone should be able to do what they want, right, with their bodies. I mean, of course. But these moves, like the introduction of the birth control pill, sometimes happened without any feminist consciousness and would sometimes replicate the same hegemonic and oppressive dynamics that existed before them. So I, you know, I got to be a little bit critical of Hooks here, though, because she comes ding close to slut shaming and you know this isn't the fr there are, there are some other things about in hooks's work that i that kind of rubbed me the wrong way like her her view of rap music for example like a lot of like it's fine but it's like you gotta kind of take it with a grain of salt but we need to be critical of her here because she uncritically criticizes sex work by saying that sex workers in her words in her words Sex workers refuse to acknowledge the fact that whenever a woman prostitutes her body because she cannot satisfy material needs in other ways, she risks forfeiting that space of sexual integrity where she controls her body. So the qualification here is that in situations where women are forced to do it, she's saying that they do not have autonomy. And I'm like, eh, but, you know, they kind of do. There are a lot of sex workers who are feminists, who are very much aware of what they're doing because they can get money from it. I don't know why it's condemned. Sex work is condemned as being any less than any other kind of work. Do we say this about professional athletes who put their bodies on the line every single day that essentially their bodies are not theirs, they're their coaches or they're owned by a sports team? Why is it only when it comes to women's bodies and women claiming their bodies and doing what they want with them, that it's seen as being like, oh, you're losing your own liberation, or you're, you're letting, you know, you're just falling into men's hands. I think that sex work is actually a way to oppose male power. Not in all instances, of course, because of course there are cases where women are being trafficked or they're, they're owned by men, of course, like not those cases, which is why it should be legal, why it should be able to be done in ways that are safe for the people involved. Not to mention, of course, that there are lots of male sex workers as well that Hooks just seems to totally ignore, who do so under the exact same conditions that she describes where they are, they might be forced to, doesn't make it any less legitimate, but it's kind of weird that she's just focusing on women here. But we take this with a grain of salt. And that puts us here into chapter 16, Total Bliss, Lesbianism and Feminism. Now, to be a lesbian does not automatically mean someone will be a feminist. Like, there are lots of conservative, like, lesbians who oppose feminism. So many feminists are lesbians, obviously. Many lesbians are feminists. Feminists are lesbians. I don't know if I repeated the same thing twice there. Feminists are lesbians, and lesbians are feminists. Many of them are. But there are, of course, like, many reactionary lesbians who oppose everything, everything progressive. So for Hooks, lesbian women gave her the tools and space to craft her own self-definition. Now, feminists gave her, gave her this ability, and she, she wasn't even a lesbian. She recounts an experience in her early teaching career when some lesbian students reproached her for being into men. And this, this kind of startled her because she, was, you know, she, was, uh, she had relationships with men, and these students were like, you aren't a true feminist because you're sleeping with men. Now, while this encounter made her uneasy, she recognizes that lesbian feminists have been some of the most anti-racist feminists around and much less interested in pandering to men. So in that moment, she, she felt like attacked, but upon reflection, she was able to think like, okay, well, I can acknowledge that women, uh, that women, that men are these like vile abusers, because they are most of the time, or like of the vile abusers in the world, they happen to be men. And so she's like, you know, these lesbian students being wary of her being with men comes from a very good place and is one of pure concern for her. Now, against the mantra that feminism is the theory and lesbianism is the practice, which is, you know, part of a certain feminist circles, the idea is that you learn feminist theory and then 
to put it into practice, you just engage in lesbian relationships. Hooks is concerned about this because it erases the ways that lesbian couples are also not like they aren't these utopian havens for equitable living. Many of them have instances of intimate partner violence. Like lesbians are not just magically anti-oppressive. There are a lot of abusive lesbian couples. And so she's like, you know, we have to be wary of those as well because they're an extension, they're an expression of the patriarchal violence she described earlier. So feminism also has to reckon with its history of homophobia and its current homophobia, of course. Or what, you know, even today, like the way, uh, like TERFs, like trans exclusionary radical feminists, feminists who think that trans women are not real women and do not deserve to be a part of that movement. So all of these things should be challenged at the heart of feminism to be inclusive, not to be exclusive, not to cast people out or to keep people away. And that puts us here into chapter 17, to love again, the heart of feminism. So she begins with her own turn to feminism as a turn away from her abusive father. And, you know, if you remember from the first half, she talks about how her mother was her, the uh, loudest patriarchal voice in her, in her life. So, you know, this guy, she, it sounds like she had a rough childhood. But at first, she didn't fully understand these femi feminist disdain for men. She had been intimate with men and had nothing wrong with it. Like, she loved her father. But she, she, she's hearing about feminists, like, hating men. She's like, what? I don't hate men. So she was also uneasy with the way that some feminists framed motherhood as an oppressive cycle that could be witnessed in their own mothers, where uh, women are forced to be mothers, they are bitter because of it, they, they then act out against their, their children, their daughters, who then become mothers, and then the cycle is just forever. Hooks did not like this. I mean, people who were saying this at all. She, liked the, she didn't like this thing that they were saying. Now, she, what she especially didn't like is that in response to this observation that both fathers, mothers, men and women uh, could be oppressive, some feminists were like, well, we're just not going to love anyone because that makes us vulnerable. And until we have an equal world where sexism does not exist, we can't comfortably make ourselves vulnerable in the way that loving someone demands. And Bell Hooks didn't buy this at all. She's like, no, you know, I can love people. And, you know, there's so many instances of people loving their abusers, which isn't a good thing. But of course, it doesn't mean that love is off the table. So she's not convinced here because she fears that turning away from love would make them like toxic men, those same men they were trying to oppose. The point is to have more love, not less of it. The task should be to challenge certain expectations for love and embrace new and other ways to be, uh, to express love. And here we arrive at chapter 18, feminist spirituality. So much of the love and community Hooks would find in feminism were first given to her by her own religion and spirituality. Now, of course, not all religions and spiritualities are welcoming to women. Like, just look at the history of most of them. How many religions have, like, a majority women at the, at the front, at the face of it? Or leading it, I should say. It's a pretty good indicator if that religion is going to be, uh, is it, if it's equitable between men and women. Because it really, it really isn't a hard idea just to have equality. It's really not that hard. And you can just find out. If an institution has historically and therefore will they in the future what they'll probably look like just by looking at their history. So we know that not all religions and spiritualities are welcome, welcome, welcoming to women and others. So she has no illusions about this, but religion was one of the first ways that she actually developed community. So some women growing up in the West who grew up with Judeo-Christian values and, and religions would actually eventually turn away from that in favor of other religions who actually like worshipped women, worshipped women uh, deities like Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, just to find themselves being represented instead of, you know, God being a white dude in the sky with a beard and, and Jesus being a white dude from the Middle East, you know, tall, uh, jacked dude who, give, you know, sacrifices himself for everyone. These stories do not represent women. And these 
religious institutions do not historically represent women. Now, some other women didn't turn to other established religions. Some adopted a kind of spirituality that looked at the very fabric of the universe and saw that one of its most fundamental properties was change. The universe is never stagnant, and it's kind of one of the central properties of humankind. You know, you, you never open a textbook and, and learn about someone in history, and all it says is, yeah, this, this bloke didn't change anything. It's like, what? You never read about people who just kept stuff the same. So they believed that to be spiritual was to also have a liberation mindset because liberation implies change. And that is in line with the very fabric of the universe. So in our words, struggles then to end patriarchy are divinely ordained. The universe calls for it. It's also important to note that, like, not only are religious institutions, have they historically been opposed to women being a part of their ranks, like, they've actively opposed women's movements, like obtaining the right to abortion and other reproductive uh, health measures, for example. And that puts us here into the final chapter, chapter 19, Visionary Feminism. So radical feminism has always taken a back seat to reformist feminism that experiences less pushback. So what she's saying here is that feminists who try to work with the system, who try to make like policy changes, are reformists. Whereas radical feminists, in her words, they dream of equality and ending all discrimination and undoing climate change uh, they, they, and so many other things, of course, in really changing everything very quickly, which is what she advocates for. I mean, we need what she calls radical feminism or visionary feminism to imagine a better future because the stakes are high. Like, we have to protect the planet. We have to defend people experiencing state-sanctioned uh, oppression and violence. We must immediately start funding feminist education for everyone to make feminism accessible and not paywalled. So if you're still listening, share this. Maybe this will help someone learn about feminism. Maybe they'll find it, you know, it'll we'll bring, we'll bring them on our side. You know, we can, we can make them part of the cause. So if men don't put in the work to make more men feminists, then little will change because sexism often disallows men to listen to women. This is the, really the point of men's participation here. It's a way to combat sexism by using sexism. Because sexism just means that men don't listen to women most of the time. And so this is why it's important for men to take advantage of this and use their voices to challenge other men, or to challenge sexism, I should say. And here she ends with the following passage that I think is quite, uh, it's beautiful. So she says that feminist politics aims to end domination, to free us to be who we are, to live lives where we love justice where we can live in peace and feminism is for everybody then yeah hope that that was informative if you like what i did uh, you can like share subscribe tell your friends who knows they might get a kick out of it you can leave a leave a review and yeah if i got anything wrong or omitted anything let me know and on that note take care